Old Gold Club. Powered by Wolverhampton Building Supplies. With Mikey Burrows and Chris Ivalumo. Welcome along to the Old Gold Club. I'm Mikey Burrows. Alongside me, as ever, is Mr. Chris Awellamo. And our guest this week spent four years at Molyneux from 1994 to 1998. Welcome to the club, Mr. Steve Frogger. Thank you very much. Um, How does it feel to be back here? It's always great to come back here. Um, I've I've been many times over the years in a commentary position working with the media. um, And it brings back such special memories. It's not until you get to my age. I was 46 last week. So it seems an awful long time ago since I actually left the club. But you appreciate more and more, and Chris would get this as an ex-player now, the, the fun times, the bad times, all, everything to do with being part of a football club. But I had four incredibly special years here. Because uh, we were just talking before we started recording, and we've done a little bit on the podcast about how I feel you would fit in to the modern Wolves. And you were telling me about just how impressed you've been by the team that we have now. And it's kind of that element of... I don't know whether you realise like how you're, you know, you were part of that group that first tried the big push to get to the Premier League and to be a top team, and it's kind of like you're part of the journey to get to where we are now. It's funny in a nice way. I'm a little envious because you look at the team and the quality of players they've they've got now, and I, I watched the Chelsea game at the weekend, and I was so impressed with their organisation. That every player they must do hours of work on the training ground on where to be. But also with improved quality players comes that sort of quality of thought. Players know what to do. They can man manage on the pitch. So the better the players you play with, they know how to deal with it, an in-match situation. They don't necessarily need to rely on the manager. They know how to cope with it on the field. Um, you know, when I first came to the club, we only had we had a relatively small squad. You know, we didn't have the luxury of having a fifteen million pound player on the bench. And and our big our big issue was is that we had. We had five or six injuries to key players in that first year when we were top of the league, and and that caused us huge damage in the end. But it's kind of relevant, though, isn't it? Like it's relative. I mean, you were one of um, four players that Wolves spent a million pounds or more on in that summer of 1994. Neil Emblem, Don Goodman, Tony Daly, and yourself. And I was working this out, and I don't know whether this is absolutely for definite, but it from the list that I saw. <laughs> you were the 20th highest fee that was paid by an English club that year, and the highest was Chris Sutton, who went from Norwich to Blackburn, who was the first £5 million player. So only five times what you were transferred for, which in in the modern game, £5 million to a million, it's not, it's not a huge amount, was I it? I saw that list, yeah. It's, it's fascinating when you look back in time as to what, what the fees were. But the start of the season, you know, we got off to an absolute flyer. And I will always say to this day, the one thing that really crippled Wolves was Tony Daly's injury in pre-season. We were bought to play in tandem yeah. on either wing. Yeah. I don't think I ever played a game with Tony in my entire four years at the football club in tandem at all. And I am absolutely convinced that had he have been fit that first season, we'd have won the league by 20 points because... By and about Christmas time, we were, I'm sure we were ahead by seven, eight, nine points at one stage. And then five of us had real serious injuries. And, and then the problem began then. We started to drop down the league and we ended, off in, ended up in the playoffs. But we didn't replace any of us because I think partially because I think every, we all thought we'd be back before the end of the season. We didn't yeah. realise the severity of the injuries we all actually had. And that, and that, that really caused great difficulties in terms of of getting out of the division that year. You, you hear a lot about the, the fee for a player, it puts them under certain pressures, you know, obviously with that amount of money when you come to a club. What, how, how, did you, how did you deal with that? I loved it. I hated being a kid in a massive pond. I, I, I actually left the team that came runners up in the Premier League and won a cup final. Yeah. So dealing with pressure was, was a nothing for me. I wanted to be a bigger fish in a slightly smaller pond, if you know what I mean. I wanted the responsibility. I wanted to be the go-to player. I wanted to be have that responsibility on my shoulders to, to come to a club. And the thing for me, I knew how massive this club could be. Yeah. The support and 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 the fact. I mean, Graham. When Graham signed me, it was a no-brainer for me. I, I signed as much for him as I did for the club because he signed me as a fourteen-year-old boy when I was at Aston Villa. He then, I then got in the England under twenty-one when he was the England manager. 
and then he he tried to sign me for Wolves, and, and it was coming to the end, and it, it was a it was a real tough decision because Aston Villa offered me a contract; they wanted me to stay. There were things that went on behind the scenes that I thought I, I needed to get away, and then I had I actually had last minute talks with Liverpool, but I'd already shaken hands with Graham, right. and, and the, the, the you know the, the weight of guilt on my shoulders. Because it obviously turning down a possible move to Liverpool was a big thing at the time. Because I played with Jamie Redknapp yep. in the under 21s, so I knew a lot of the boys in the uh, Steve McManaman and a few of the lads. But I'd given I'd gave Graham my word, and 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 then you know obviously I, I signed. But also as well, the pull was Paul Birch was here, who was I was his boot boy when I was at Aston Villa, and Tony Daly, who who was best man at my wedding as well. So there were, there were lads here who I knew really well, and I was absolutely convinced we'd we'd go up. Absolutely, not, you know, and and the first few weeks of the season, that solidified that. I just yeah. thought we we looked so powerful and so strong in that first six months of the season. So what went wrong? Injuries. It really, simple, simple as that. Uh, nothing else other than injuries. That that and the infamous uh, John McGinley punch. Yeah, but we should never have got into the player. We should have. That should have been automatic promotion all day long. Yeah. We can't. I don't, I don't want to cry over spilt milk about a head, which to one of my big pals, David Kelly. I know, uh, you know, the headbutt was a massive influence, yeah. but there were still quite a few of us who never played in those playoffs because we were still injured. Yeah, we, we you know, we were top of the league and flying actually in the normal, and then we we lost four or five of us, and then we sort of dropped from top all the way down into the playoffs. And I don't, I don't think we ever actually really recovered from that. We should have gone up that year. But is it? Is it a luck element? Because you mentioned the injuries and the amount of you that, that had serious injuries at that point and missed you know, a good stretch of it. And then that kind of happens in the playoff semi-final as well. Is luck, does that play a part? Do you look at it and just go, do you know what, we were just, it wasn't meant to be for us? I don't think it's a play you want to bemoan bad luck. I, I, it was, the circumstances just dictated that you know, the footballing gods weren't shining on us that year. And it, it, was re- it was really hard for me, Mikey, because my injury was far worse than first off. So I, I, did, I did my ankle against Reading. It was, it, was, it was a horrific tackle that took me out. And when I came back, it was before the end of the season. I thought, I'm going to be OK. Anyway, my ankle just wasn't right. I'd, I'd been out for two or three months. And I was trying to get on it. And I kept saying to the physio, there's something not quite right here. So we went for a scan and they found out that actually my ankle was basically shattered and that I needed to have a full ankle ligament reconstruction. So then when I came back from that four or five months later, I then went, started training, getting back into it again. And I felt exhausted in a way that I've never felt before, in a really strange way. I was losing weight. I, honestly, I looked like Casper the Friendly Ghost. I, I, I just looked drained. I mean, the thing is... I, I look, I look back at pictures of me with a kit on and I, I, I look like one of those uh, base jumpers. Have you ever seen a picture yeah, of me as a player? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had these skinny legs, skinny arms. I was about nine stone wet through. But this particular time, I looked like I was a week away from death. So I went, I went, we, I went to have tests at the Nuffield in Wolverhampton. Anyway, within five minutes, there was major issues. They'd realised that my oxygen level was dangerously low. And then when they scanned me, they realised, and no one had picked up on this before, I, I had something, I've got double femoral veins, which apparently one in 30, 40 million people have, where if you have a blood clot, it forms a blood clot and you know straight away. When you've got femoral veins, the blood clot can go at one vein and can be hidden. And when they scanned me, I had blood clots fired all around my heart and lungs. I was a, I was a, a day away from dying, literally. Oh, I, we had a game on the Wednesday. Had I played in the game, they said you literally could have died. Which was in hindsight is quite. Scary. I can laugh about it now, but it was quite scary. So <laughs> I don't know whether I could laugh about and, it at any point. And, and the, sir, the doctor, the, the the consultant said to me, "You've got to quit football." He actually said to me, "You've got to retire from football. You can't. You can't do this." And I went, "Well, that that's not an option on my table. So how are we going to get around this?" So we went. I had to have a course of blood thinners, and and then obviously we fly. I had to I had to be really careful from there on in about how I live my life and not to allow stress to affect me because stress can bring on blood clots. Yep. So I had, I had to totally change the way I thought about football and, and actually life, which is really weird. You, you just said the other stress brings it on, but that as well as trying to keep yourself at a certain level to go out and perform, and that, it just doesn't make sense. It's not possible. I'm, I'm just trying to get it through my head here. 
Medication helped yeah. because obviously I had to keep the blood thin. I there were certain things I couldn't eat, drink, you know, things that would make make it worse. I mean, I'd, I'd never suffered a problem with it. I would say touch wood now since. Mm. So obviously, when I go on flights now, I have to be really careful. I make sure I take aspirin, especially on long long haul flights, because I'm prime candidate for getting something. So yeah, I mean that was a really scary time. But but the, the worst thing about that period was it was not that. Funnily enough, it was me being in a hospital bed when Wolves were getting beat at the start of the following season and Graham got sacked. And, f- and that was a hammer blow to me because I- that's the only regret I've ever had in football was that. And, and it wasn't my fault. I didn't, you know, I wasn't to know I was going to be out for well over a year with this injury and yeah. the blood clots and everything else. It was just a horrific string of circumstances yeah. that led to that. But Graham went too early for me. I- I- I'm still absolutely convinced we'd have been promoted with him at the helm at some stage. Because that's what, why I talk about uh, luck and, and listening to you talking about being potentially one game away, one day away from a f- potential fatal issues. It seems silly talking about luck now, but it's that element of uh, things conspired against that team almost. You know, you, you had that yeah. situation and, and you're there and there were other people and we've spoken to people in that group. You know, Tony Daly yeah. has been on the podcast, Jeff Thomas has been on the podcast and you all kind of have that similar view that could, we couldn't do anything about it. We couldn't be there. It, yeah, it was such a shame because they were such a brilliant group of lads. I mean, we you know we, we still get together if we can once a year, at least once a year now. We, the, the boys are all really busy all over the place working, but we all we all you know twenty five years later still make a conscious effort to try and keep in touch and see each other. And, and the first thing we always talk about when it happens, first thing. How did we never get promoted? It's the first thing everybody says. We still laugh once a year now about, you know, the, the look we did or didn't have or, or whatever. But I'm convinced had that team have got promoted, they'd have done really well in the Premier League because there's quite a few boys who actually then went back to the Premier League a few years later who went on to be quite successful. Because the, obviously the, the next big opportunity was the um, playoff defeat to Crystal Palace. But... You didn't feature in that one either. And I was, I was uh, another long-term layoff I had. So I, I had two long-term layoffs really while whilst I was um, here. Yeah, and I missed out. It, it was, a, it was a real shame because, again, you feel you feel helpless, don't you? You get to the point where you get, you know, you, you help the team into a position where you get into the playoffs, and you sat there, and you just feel useless because you want to be out there helping your teammates. And you, you know, threw one through another, bad tackles, which was usually the case with me, yeah. and I couldn't play. How how did you deal with that then? You know, because like you say, we, we spoke earlier about uh, the, the the player today, not not kind of I guess in adverse adverse situations. Are they prepared for it? Have they went through situations that have? You did go through these things. You were tough, and like we we grew up with nothing. Yeah. You know. So how did you deal with that? That must have been effective. I went through depression myself. I've spoke open about it. But those moments when you think you've came to Wolves because you can see the potential there, you wanted to be the the main man, and which is which is that, that you've got to have that drive as a footballer, haven't you? But how did you? That must have affected you mentally. I think after being told I could have died while I was playing in a game, Precision, completely changed my my outlook right. on on football and life. I just yep. thought, you, you, some situations you just can't change, can you? And what, what I particularly hated about being injured was those long, long days of being stuck in the gym on your own. And, and, it, and it was awful. And actually, it, it, it became, I just got bored sometimes. And, and I got restless and I got irritated. And, you know, you go through spells of anger. And it's, it's your partner in, at home that has to deal with that. You, yeah. you sort of front up at, at the football club and pretend you're okay and you're not. But I used to, I used to, be, I used to play awful tricks on the lads in the dressing room. Because... Um, I remember Stow- Mike Stowell came in this one day and he spent, I think he was £250 on a really nice pair of shoes. So I went home next day and I brought a Stanley knife in and I cut the soles out the bottom of his shoes and stuck it with a little bit of light glue in. And I remember him coming in and putting his foot through the shoe. Never, We never told him who did it. <laughs> and we had a spell list. Don Goodman came in with a brand new... I think it was a Hugo Boss suit. It was a really nice suit. So when he went out for training, we got duct tape and put... Added us three stripes all the way down his suit, both sides, all the way down his legs. Anyway, when he came back and pulled it off, he pulled off his arm off of his of his suit jacket. So this went on for quite a few months. And now I knew I was playing with fire with some of the senior players. And the thing is, if you give it out in football, you've got to expect to get it back. Yeah. Anyway, so we were playing Middlesbrough away. And I'd got on the coach and I thought, okay, it was a really hot weekend that weekend. 
unbeknown to me, the boys had been plotting to get me back. So one of them had nicked my car keys, took an imprint of, it was the old fashioned one, we, the, the, so they took a print and they'd all been saving sour milk for weeks. So they'd all left pints of milk outside for weeks on end. They took open my car, it was a convertible, and they poured pints of sour milk all over my leather seats in the car. So we've gone away for the weekend to Middlesbrough on a steaming hot weekend. I came back, opened my door, and I went, I nearly threw up in my car, the stench of the car. I had to take my roof down on the way home. The, the, the lads were crying because they, they knew what they'd done. And it was that situation again where you've got to take it on the chin, haven't you? You know, if you're dishing it out, you've got to on, take it the other way. I had the car validated seven times. In the in the end, I had to sell the car, Chris, because it stunk that badly. No matter how much I cleaned the car, I had to get rid of the car. <laughs> how did they know it was you? Surely you. I think I think someone had grasped me up in the end. So so, so you had confided in someone that it was you I, behind all the. Yeah, yeah. So they've let you so down. Hang on, who who did you confide in? Who's the who's the snake? It could be anybody. I mean, the thing is, it could have been. I mean. It, it, you know, I mean, it was name really name fun. Steve. I had it come into me, and then, then actually, then, then when Robbie saw, when Robbie came into the team, I took Robbie under my wing, and he became my partner in crime. So we used to start doing it together. Robbie Keane, this yeah, is. Robbie. This wasn't Robbie at the time, the first time round, but when Robbie actually kept, broke into the first team at a later date, when you know, um, under Mark McGee. Then, then I took him under my wing and he, he became my accomplice in most of the things that we did in the dressing room. Come on, Steve. I want to know who, I want to know who shopped you to everybody. Well, I don't know. Because we're going to get them on this programme. <laughs> <laughs> but that kept me... That, that actually, when you talk about... That, Chris, kept me sane. With, without that sort of laughter and the, the, the jokes we used to have in the dressing room. I, I remember winding Bully up all the time. And he always, he always got me back. Because when, when I first signed for the club, I could not understand a word he said. N not a clue. So me and Tony Daly, we, we, we were sat down in the dressing room and Bully was talking to us. And I was just nodding away. And I'm looking at Dale thinking, you understand a word he's just said? So we, we used to have this thing, and Bully was brilliant. He, 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 because because he was, it was strange for him because all of a sudden the club was spending big money on players. So he was the main man and, and, and he, he actually was adopted us really well he, he helped us integrate into the side and he was fantastic but if I wound Bully up you know Bully's got a grip like a vice don't yeah, you yeah. right so with my little spindly legs I used to go for a massage every morning and Bully sometimes took over the massage without me knowing <laughs> oh my oh my life he used to grab my how I was never injured for six weeks after Bully grabbing me I'll never know <laughs> Because he used to get in and stick. Because he's really strong, bully, isn't he? You ever shook his hand? Yeah. It's like a, it's like a vice, isn't it? So, you know, it, it was just, it was a, it was a great time. And and the other th thing as well with bully, he deserved the chance of playing the Premier League. And that was a, some another reason I was gutted for him because we never did it on his watch yeah. either. Where you know he'd shown such great loyalty to the football club and he deserved to play in the top flight at some stage, but but sacrifice that to to stay here. Um, you talk about Bully being strong. There is an infamous game that I wanted to ask you about. It was at Bolton, January 1997. So it's a couple of years on from what had happened in the playoffs, and it's there was a, a 22 man brawl <laughs> of which reportedly Bully took two shots to the chin and still stayed up were you in the fight I don't think I was were you one of the 22 <laughs> or were you one of the others being nine stone wet through I would have been definitely on the periphery of that one <laughs> see the thing is I was, I, I was always smart as a winger when the ball came in for, I was always the one on the edge of the box watching all the elbows flying around that wasn't for me none of that <laughs> but do you remember that fight because yeah. I, I think it somebody there's a report that suggests that it was Mark Venus and John Sheridan that started it and everybody else piled in. I mean, in them time, there was argy bargy nearly every game. I mean, I mean the tunnels, I, I can't remember most games where there was something not kicking off in a tunnel after a game, especially in the local derbies as well. They, you know, they, they got a bit frisky at times. Now we're talking. Yeah. So who on Albion did you punch? Me, nobody. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit. Tell you what, I'm a bit bigger now than I used to be. I I, I just couldn't put weight on in them days. Uh, but you know, obviously when we, when we went to Albion, we we beat them four two at the Hawthorns. That was that was tasty, all round the pitch. And off it. And off it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The game. They they they. You know things that. Well, you just wouldn't what, get away with them now, Chris. Do you, do you, what do you see that as? I see that as a 
I see that as a negative in today's game. You know, I think that was part and parcel of it. You know, I played in a lot of derbies and you used, you, I used to love those. <laughs> Hang on a minute. You see it as a negative I do, I, I, that I, I, players aren't fighting with no, each other now. No, you're taking it the wrong way, but that, <laughs> you know, like the, I guess the, there's... I. The challenges that come in and there's the off off the pitch, the the, the little argy bargy and the more like, ev- everyone's a journalist. Like I done when I done my, yeah. my journalism degree, like anyone with a phone can be a can, can be a journalist. They put the information out there, they can put it on social media. And it has it has affected a lot of things. Like we're hearing stories there of your uh, your little pranks and, and how it came back. That would be on that'd be news. That'd be news oh, yes. today. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that little little things like that that's needed. I've, I've I've been first hand, I've seen things happen, but I think things are, are slowly disappearing from the game. I'm not saying I'm all for it, but <laughs> I, yeah, I, twenty-two man brawls have disappeared from the but, game. No, but it does. It's, there's, there's, a, there's a bit to it. Like there's a derby. Like my, one of my good friends, Saji Button, played for Port Vale. I played for Stoke. We signed at the same time. We were close. We we killed each other in in, in the game. Like we absolutely. But after the match, it was it was part, we went and had a drink together. But in the match, you are enemies. Well, that's the big. Di- that's this is the great difference, Chris. Is I found that once the foreign players started to, to come in a lot. There was not a drinking culture. So we would have a we would literally kick lumps out of each other in a derby day and you're gonna have a pint with them. Yeah. And you'd shake hands. And that's how it was dealt with. The trouble was dealt with but over a pint. Finished. Until the next derby day. Yeah. And then it all kicked <laughs> off again. And for me that was great fun because they always had that spar, that edge. Derby days were the best. I, it was it was the one game that I, I always really used to look forward to. Um, talking of games that you must have looked forward to, obviously the, in your final season at Wolves, the FA Cup run. Yes. Um, we talked a little bit about it with Don because obviously he played a big part in the quarter final, but you missed. I missed the quarter final, but played in the I played in the semi final. And to come so close, and you know there was a fans will always point to the fact that you know they suggest Mark McGee got the team wrong that day. You're not in. You agree? Yeah, no, I, I, I think he got it completely wrong on the day. Um, I mean, that, for me, that 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 day was really special on so many ways. I mean, obviously, I, I was going back to Villa Park for the first time to go and see the stadium full of black and gold, and that, they out sang Arsenal for the entire ninety minutes. They were just sensational, the fans that day. But as much as the team was wrong, I, I mean, the strike he got the strikers completely wrong. I don't, you know, I don't know what he was thinking. We didn't have enough movement up front. We didn't have enough pace up front to, to try try and beat the players that they had. But that was a great Arsenal side. That yeah. team went on to win the double that year. I mean, we're talking, they had the best central pairing partnership, I think, in world football at that time. And I know people might say Roy Keane and Paul Scholes. But I'm telling you, Patrick Vieira and Emmanuel Petit were just phenomenal. They were six foot four. Could they could They could mix it. They could win everything in the air. And that was the big. Pro- I think they were that good in the in the centre of the park that they, they actually controlled the game. And as a player, when you're playing in a game where you know they're controlling it, it's very difficult because most of the time I was playing wing back, we couldn't get forward enough. And that was a real shame because I, I had the beating of Grimondi. I had him. I, I knew I'd had him. He wasn't quick enough. I could, but we just couldn't get the ball. We didn't, re- you know, retain possession enough to to do it. That 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 you, know, you said there that he got the team wrong that day. Now that that group of players were they had some big voices in that that dressing room as yeah. well. Now I'm sure that 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 opinion's echoed. What does do anyone approach the manager? Is that is that I'm just saying? Did they have that chat to the manager about the team selection? Because because it, it does it will be uh, I guess it will hit the hit, everyone knows what their what everyone will have an idea of what their team is. Yeah. When he when he says the team. Surely there's a bit. Oh, what's going on here? Or not? I think. I think. I think the controversial. I think what you you're alluding to is Steve Claridge playing would be the one. I think. I think that's the main thing everybody was looking at. Yeah, the fact that there was no bully or Robbie King. Yeah, I th- that that was clearly for me. That was a mistake because on the day Steve was in effect. It, it, Steve didn't have a great time at Wolves. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, he did terrific everywhere else. You know, if you look at his record, yeah. he was a great goal scorer. Steve, he was, but it, it didn't happen from where we were, and it and we were quite surprised as a group of players when he named the side and and Steve was starting. Um, you know, it, it was made for Bully particularly to wrestle against the, the powerful centre arse. That but that that was made for Bully that game. Because he would have made it really difficult for them. And they wouldn't have maybe have had as much possession from the central areas to play through and then dominate as, as they, they would have done through the central areas. 
because it's like you mentioned bully it, it felt like almost like bully's last hurrah it's you know that thing because a lot of people have said you know he never got to play in the top division yeah you know he'd, he'd come close and whether you guys felt that you know like this is the one last chance that maybe as a group of them because you were still young at the time i was yeah yeah but there's still a couple of guys in there that you know that's the last chance to get to that final to it have was. that big moment I think in hindsight, again, looking at the game, I think we, you know, we should have been, we should be proud of ourselves, because we gave the best team in the country a game mm -hmm. at that time, and we had players missing. You know, Simon Osborne wasn't available, who would have helped with the retention of the ball in the middle of the park. We, we had people missing. Obviously, Robbie didn't play. Bully didn't play. Yet we were only beat by the double winners one nil. We, we gave them a, a real game, and the, the, the goal killed it because once they'd scored, they just, they just controlled the game. Had we have got ahead in that game, it might have been more interesting. And you went at the end of that season. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was, again, that was a real surprise to me because the start of the following year, I'd had a full pre-season. I'd played my longest string of games in a Wolf shirt without any major injury problems. Um, and I spoke, I'd actually spoken with Mark McGee and I said, right, I'm ready to stay because I saw the new side he'd put, we'd put together with Robbie and and Dean Rich and all the lads in there thinking this is going to be a really good team there's some real genuine quality in it so I went to Mark and said right because I'd signed a one year extension the year before mm -hmm. and I said I'll, I'm ready to commit my future to the club I want a four year deal I'm happy because I can see what the club's trying to do now absolutely fine and then I was told then I wasn't getting a contract which I thought was really bizarre because I was only 24 24, yeah, I think it was about 24. 24, 25. 24, 25. So I, was, I wasn't even near the peak of my... And you had that chat yourself, not an agent, nothing like that? No, this was, this was directly with the, the hierarchy of the football club and the manager. Right. And, it, and Mark McGee wanted, wanted me to stay, but people up above had said they were cashing in, in effect. And, and also that Robbie Keane was going to get sold not long after me. So that, that came as a massive shock because we were flying at the start of that season. We made a really strong start to the league. And then I got that information that I was actually going to be sold, whether I liked it or not. And that was, that was, it, was it, it was hard to take because I, I kind of felt like I'd left and I wasn't ready to go because it was unfinished business because I'd never got the team promoted. Yeah. And, and you know, it's like as a player, once, once you're told... That, that you're going to be sold, then you just get on with it, I guess. And and that, that's what happened in the end. Because um, you were linked to Liverpool and Middlesbrough. Yes. I think that's right, before you ended up at Coventry. That's right, yeah. Well, I actually went up to, I actually went up and had talks with Middlesbrough. And it was, it was, again, that was bizarre because they offered me Paul Merson's house up on, the, the, was it the Wynyard Estate? Wynyard, yeah, they've got an estate up there called the Wynyard Estate. So I've gone in there and obviously Merce had left in a hurry because his house was full of his clothes, his TVs, <laughs> his beer, his fridge was full of beer. Uh, but it, it just didn't sit right. I mean, I, I've always been a family man. I, I keep, I try and, you know, I've always tried to keep myself to myself in a way, you know. Um, and the move there wasn't right for me. So I then went and spoke with Gordon Strachan and that was bizarre because uh, Mark McGee was Gordon Strachan's best man at his wedding. Well, you know this big very, man better than anybody. Close, they, yeah. they were massive pals, weren't they? Yeah. So, so... It, obviously, I think it caused a bit of trouble between the two of them because Gary McAllister came and watched me a couple of times and then I'd had a meeting with Gordon and then that was it, the move was done. And then not long after, as predicted, Robbie came and joined me. So what, what they told me from above was actually did actually happen in the end. So they were... I, I, think, I think at the time, Sir Jack had just decided that he'd spent an awful lot of money on the football club. He, he, I don't think he felt like he was getting the return he wanted at the time. Mm -hmm. And so Jack was, I mean, he was great. He was brilliant with me all the way through. And the thing is, he was always honest. Honest, that's what you want. He, he never, you know when you get some people, Chris, where they say one thing and you know they're lying. Yeah. With Sir Jack, he just told you how it was. There was no mincing with him, no no lies. And I, and I always respected him hugely for that. Um, so, you know, the decision was made. But I, I just felt it was a real shame because I thought we had the basis of something. And then three or four years later, when Dave Jones took over, he then went and spent big that's again. That's business though, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's a businessman thinking, right, you know what, I've threw a lot of money at it. We're not quite getting the return, whatever it may be. Yeah. So I'm going to regroup again, take yes. my, sell my assets. And then when I think the, right, the time's right again, I'll go at it Absolutely. again. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what that he is, did. Because football is a business now as well. Yes. It's got to be run pitch side 
and the the commercial side of it as well. It's all got to go, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it has. Yeah, but it but it left me feeling like I'd I'd left before my time was ready. It, yeah. it wasn't like I said I wanted to leave because I'd asked for I'd asked for a long term contract to stay, and I was twenty four, thinking, well, you know, I'm not even close to my prime yet. But but in, I was lucky. I went to Coventry and I, you know I played in the Premier League again and got in the England squad. So I, I can't complain. It's not anything I'm moaning about. But when you look back, I think you know it. it the Wolves situation is the one thing for me not getting promoted was the one thing that sort of rank, rankles for me over during that time. Okay. Um, we're going to talk a lot more on our podcast extra and give you the opportunity to have a go at some of your teammates because uh, our regular watchers and listeners will know that a few have had a go at you, <laughs> certainly for your dress sense. Uh, back in the day, you're looking alright today, by the way. I've made an effort made an purposely. Effort. Well, made yeah, an effort. Really. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that on our podcast extra, which will be available to download from all the usual places as well. Don't forget, as ever, you can always get in contact with us, Old Gold Club at Wolves.co.uk at Wolves across social media as well. Make sure to download our Steve Frogger edition of the Old Gold Club. Thank you for watching. The Old Gold Club, powered by Wolverhampton Building Supplies, with Mikey Burrows and Chris Iwalumo.